the Sangha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samha sambhu dasa Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo saranto sucedo ye hulahuri samyao sampatoshye. Namo saranto sucedo ye hulahuri samyao sampatoshye. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa, bai qian wan yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou chi. The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, uh, welcome to our Sutra Lecture tonight. This is the 1st of November. How about that? We've made it into November. And I'll say it tonight at the beginning and I'll say it later. This is the end of Daylight Savings today. Today we go back to regular time. So spring ahead, fall behind. We fall behind means what? It's we lose an hour, right? So is that right? Or we gain an hour? Gain an hour, gain an hour. So it's it at when does it change? It changes at two or two or three, something like that. So when you wake up in the morning, you get an extra hour of sleep. But don't forget, because you'll get there an hour early if you don't remember. And then you'll think, oh, why didn't they tell us? So we'll mention it now at the start, and we'll mention it again in the, in the, at the close that um, we set our clocks back tonight. Tomorrow morning, it's an hour l- earlier than it is now. So we are here in Berkeley, California. It's the year 2014. We're looking into the 10 grounds chapter. We're on the sixth ground. And we start by invoking with an open heart the spiritual presences that brought this sutra into being. Their names are here on the front of the text. We'll chant it in Chinese and start from there. Namo Namo Tafang Guang Fo 
Going to audition a new. Suddenly got louder, huh? Going to audition a new um, audio recorder tonight. So, please turn to page twelve and thirteen. We want to say hello to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, that group is gradually growing. So, this lecture winds up on YouTube. So, if folks are um, interested in hearing it again, if you're here in person, or if you're listening now, um, you found Dharma Realm Live, D-H-A-R-M-A, R-E-A-L-M Live. It's a YouTube channel. And not only my Saturday night lectures, but uh, Professor Martin Verhoeven's Friday night lectures on the Six Patriarch Sutra are also there. And uh, the nights that I've been away traveling, uh, Dharma Master Jin Chuan, Jin Fo, Jin Fan, uh, and others, have, their talks are also uh, archived there. So we're uh, making good use of technology. It um, can be a valuable tool. And what happens if you subscribe? You get notified when there's something new, right? And you also, if you miss a lecture, it'll come up, I think, a couple days later and let you know. Cool. And you can say, oh, yeah, I saw it, or I didn't, and watch it then. Sam is saying that you can subscribe to a YouTube channel. You just click on it. It's simple. You have to log in. YouTube is owned by Google, so if you have a Gmail address, you're halfway home. Um, you can log on, and then you, YouTube, you subscribe to Dharma Realm Live and as Sam is saying it gets you you get notified when uh, when the new lecture has been posted so page 12 and 13 we are investigating the sixth ground out of ten sixth ground all of these ten kind of chapters in the larger chap sub chapters in the larger chapter are talking about the bodhisattva and the bodhisattva uh, his motivations and his thoughts and his actions are all recorded here in this chapter and the sixth ground the um, the ten grounds correspond to another structure that we find in the sutra which is the called the paramitas the perfections and so one corresponds to one. First paramita corresponds to the first ground. So if you know how that system goes, when you get to part six, it's called prajna paramita, the perfection of wisdom. And it's a different way of using your mind. So ordinarily we use our minds to tell difference. Day and night are different. Men and women are different. Right and wrong are different. Sweet and sour are different. And that's ordinary consciousness. It helps to be able to know the difference between the green light, hit the gas, and the red light, hit the brake. It's important to know that difference. When you get to wisdom, wisdom does this strange thing. It makes everything the same. It does away with duality. And, of course, if you're driving a car and you need to know which is which, that's not very helpful. But if you're wanting to understand, as the founder of our faith did, the, the prince, Siddhartha, if you want to know where suffering comes from, if you want to know where pain comes from, if you want to know why it hurts, and certainly I'm one of those people, 
and how to make the hurt stop, then being able to make hurt and not hurt come back to letting the branches of the tree come back to the root, that's very helpful. It's very helpful. And what's the difference? A way of seeing. You're seeing things differently. Are things different? No. It's just that before, caught in duality, we thought we had it right. From the Buddhist point of view, we were still asleep. We didn't see it the way it is. We saw it the way our karmic habit patterns taught us to see it. Once you get to the sixth level, Prajnaparamita, you open another eye, so to speak. You open another kind of vision. You see it fresh. And it's not bound by my habitual way of seeing things. If you want to know what we're talking about, if you speak Chinese or Vietnamese or French or German or Italian or Spanish or Russian or Greek, you're going to see the world differently than if you speak English or Spanish. If you come at the world with the conditioning that women bring, you're going to see the world differently than the conditioning of man. Wisdom vision, where it says all dharmas are impartially the same, then there's choice, there's freedom, there's liberation. All right, so that's where we are. We're on that sixth stage. And the Buddha, when he was talking about what the Bodhisattva knows in the sixth ground, he started describing this very interesting dharma that we've been working on now for a couple months. And it's just one. There's just one teaching here in the sixth ground. And that's the teaching called, it's a mouthful in Sanskrit, Pratitya Samutpada. Pratitya Samutpada. That's so hard to pronounce, nobody's ever named a rock group after Pratitya Samutpada. Nah, I wouldn't make Billboard top 100, wouldn't. Pratitya Samutpada and the Bodhisattva. Mm -mm. Wouldn't make it. It's a difficult... So most people... It's, it's even kind of an in-word among scholars. If you can drop that into the conversation, people go, Oh, dude. You know. What do we say instead? Well, we have a bunch of complicated translations for it. There, I think I know five that I've heard. Um, we're going to look into it tonight. Dependent co-arising. There you go. That's easy, huh? Dependent co-arising. Um, another word that is semi-popular is interdependent. Interdependent relying on each other to come into being. That's, so we were stuck with a long concept, a long word, but I think it'll be clear. What it means essentially is nothing exists all by itself. Everything depends on other things to come into being. Here's a good example of it. The body, the mind, depends entirely upon parents right, on temperature, on food and drink, on gravity. It's endless, the number of conditions that I depend upon. And those things depend upon me to name, to understand, etc. So, Pratitya Samutpada, that's what we're studying. The Buddha's teaching that idea here. We've been kind of slogging our way through it and approaching it with a bunch of analogies like what we've talked about lifting the hood on a car, on an auto, on an automobile down and use our uh, electronic tools to let you see print. Okay, I want you to see some words tonight and it will help us penetrate what's going on because last week we got into our is it the second complete run-through? Let's see. On, um, let's see. On page 9, we had the first run-through. On page 11, we had the second run-through. And now on page 13, we've got the third run-through, the long list of 12. 12, 12, 12. And I know there are folks sitting here who are saying, uh, I'm sitting here trusting that you're going to make sense out of this. But at at this moment, I'm not getting it. 
12 of anything is a lot, right? So I want to give people a visual with the words right now. And ordinarily, I'm really happy to sit here with my legs crossed. It, it gives me some connection with the ground. Uh, and I like to not move around when I lecture. Um, but I think tonight we're going to make a little, little detour um, to give you the words so you can see the whole, blah, 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 all 12 in sequence in their context. And then um, in the weeks to come, as we're going continuing through the 12, you'll be able to say, oh, right, right. He said, it's, that's, now I see it more clearly because I saw the whole thing from 1 to 12 and back again. Okay, so that's what we're about to do. All right, any, any questions at this point or requests as we go through it? Um, I want people to make these your own. Um, it's really helpful. This is a helpful uh, way of looking at what the Buddha's fundamental issue was, which was, I can see ahead that my life, no matter what I accomplish as king of India, is going to come to a heap of dirt with maybe a stone, and I'm a prince, so it'll be a big one, but nothing more. This is going to recycle, and people might put me in a history book if I'm a great savage king, warrior, or they might call me a great benefactor, or they might be nothing, you know, but that's where it's coming. I'm not satisfied. There's got to be more. The prince's immortal words are, is this all? Is this all there is? He set out to answer that question. Is this all? Right? I saw a picture last night of uh, Albert Einstein playing his violin. He found meaning in his violin because he was totally in charge of creating those vibrations and sending them out into the universe with a wish to benefit, kind of like a prayer. How satisfying compared to struggling with this theory that it's going to be shot down by so-and-so in his department at Princeton and then is going to be challenged by the school in Germany and then he's got to work out all, and then it might still not work out because there's gravitational pull that kind of makes no sense. And then, you know, how frustrating, how futile. And, and ultimately, he doesn't know. What was he afraid of? He was very much afraid that the things he was talking about were going to be turned into weapons, which indeed they were. He was a Pisces. He had a big, soft heart. And nobody's going to turn the music of his violin into a weapon, right? Nobody can possibly make that vibration evil, harmful, lethal. So to see that frizzy-haired Pisces genius playing his violin and just, you know, opening his heart is very wonderful. Very wonderful. Puts it in perspective. So, Okay. I'm going to stand up. Uh, we're going to hook up the machines and give me a second. We're going to... Uh, let's, let's first do the text. Let's do the text first. I want to repeat um, where we were last week because it's our closest run-through of the 12. So I'm on page 12, second paragraph, starting with Fozi. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom because it's 12 after all. All right? Let me give you a line and you repeat. Fozi, Tsi Pusa Mohusa, Fu Zo Shi Nian, San Jie Soyo, Wei Shi Yi Xin, Ru Lai Yu Tsi, Fen Bie Yan Shuo, Shi Er You Zhi, Jie Yi Yi Xin, Okay, now we'll continue with the list. Here comes the twelve. Ready? Sui Shi Tan Yu Yu Xin Gong Shang Xin Shi 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 Xing Yu Xing Mi Huo Shi Wu Ming Yu Wu Ming Ji Xin Gong Shang Shi Ming Se 
，名次增长，是六处，六处三分，何为处？处共生十寿。受无厌足是爱，爱舍不舍是取，比诸有之，圣师有，有所起名生，生熟未老，老坏未死。Okay, it's rare that we don't get four in a row. They have four, five, seven, and、uh, okay. All right, over to the right. We're now going to put our palms together. These are the words of the Buddha. We're going to read in unison the paragraph starting with disciples of the Buddha. Here we go. Ready with me? Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, then thinks. Everything whatsoever in the threefold realms is only a single thought. The Tathagata extrapolates this one thought into twelve distinct branches, each of which depends entirely upon that one thought for its existence. Why is it so? Okay, very important answer here to his rhetorical question. Here we go. Ready? Because thoughts and desires arise together with the deeds that are done. Thoughts are consciousness, deeds are activities, and confusion about activities is ignorance. Name and form arise together with ignorance, and thoughts. And when name and form grow, they create the six places. The six places, three divisions, combine to create contact. Contact then brings forth feeling. When feeling becomes insatiable, then love is the result. Love holds on and does not let go until there is grasping. The branch of existence creates existence. Then birth comes from existence. When birth ripens, it ages, and when age goes bad, it creates death. All right. So, if that's a little opaque, just wait. We're going to take a look.、Um, so, folks, can close your sutra now if you like. I'm not going to be referring specifically to it. Um, but I'm going to explain the system it's referring to. First, I want you all to appreciate my bird. Locke, would you be able to turn off the, the that list? This is called a kurawang. Not only is it a kurawang, it's a pied kurawang.、Uh, turn off that one too. Yeah, got it. There we go. He is、uh, notice his yellow eyes, and notice his very sharp claws. He is、uh, currently a daddy.、Uh, he just gave birth, and Ali, my kookaburra, who is bigger than him by twice, is afraid of him. This one is guarding his nest close to our house, and no one, nobody else, no other bird can come near until that baby has grown up and flown away, because he's got the whole area turfed off. So, quite a character. Okay, here we go. All right. Now,、um, I want you all to get used to looking at these words here. We're going to be talking about not that. I'm going to be talking about this one right there. Here's the、um, here's the word I just gave you. Pratitya samutpada. There it is. And in Chinese, this is called the Shi'ar Inyan Fa, the twelve 
links the Dharma, the method, the technique of 12 causes and conditions. Pratitya, everybody say Pratitya. Samut Pada. We're not used to having a T and a P together. You have to say Samut Pada, right? And if you can, you can wiggle your head. You can look very authentic. You go, Samitya Pratitya Samut Pada. Pratitya Samut Pada. Very good, very good. Twelve links of interdependent co-arising, um, interdependency, depending upon each other. Emptiness uh, that has come up in our, in our sixth ground. It means that nothing exists on its own. Everything is born from of conditions. There is nothing at the core of any thing, phenomena. Of any phenomena, all things must be connected to the whole in order to exist. Okay, got that much? Here's a statement. This is what we're going to talk about today. We haven't talked about this yet. We've just been kind of going through the line. And it's, it's a mistake to think that the 12 links are a straight line. It's not a linear dharma. It's not that you start at ignorance and you wind up at death and suffering. You can go that way, but immediately it's back to ignorance again. Because when you die... Mostly, you, you're, we're clueless. You know, we're back. We just check out. We don't know why we went, where we went. So that's one way of looking at these links. The other interesting thing, and if I, I would have to uh, animate it, if I, if I could use some of Adobe's tools to do animation or whatever is the latest cool package, I would do it this way. I would create a little ignorance and then have the second branch, the volitional activities, come out of it and pull it into being and then pull the next one, consciousness, and then pull the next one because these all link each other. But then, once they were all out there, probably run them in a circle because they would start tugging each other and the circle goes on and on and on and it rolls. But then, the fun part, and this is what, what's amazing, is... Each individual link independently goes back to ignorance and then brings forth everything. They link not only one to the other in a circle, they link across the circle to each other. So love comes from ignorance, for example. And activities produces death and suffering and suffering. So they interreact. Each is a cause, each is an effect. And they say, if you can get this, if you can understand it, you understand what the Buddha saw. This is what's different about what the Buddha saw, was how each of these aspects in one thought are a cause for the next thing and was describing. To think of this as a snapshot is to get one, one fingertip of something the Buddha was describing as a whole body. This is a moving, living system. Not only that, it's happening inside each one of us right this minute. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to get to make sense of today. Every single thing arises, all things arise because of conditions. Mutual coming into being and dependent uh, mutually coming into being and all things are dependent on all things for each one's existence. Sounds Buddhist, doesn't it? Oh boy. This is not to be understood in a linear way. Each link is a cause and each is also an effect. The chicken is in the egg and the egg is in the chicken. Aren't you glad that finally you've had an answer to that old riddle? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The, the Buddhist answer is both. 
and neither, right? They mutually both come into being. Now, if you want to ask why do they cross the road, well, you better go to Hinduism or, you know, Christianity. They cross the road to get saved or something. But anyway, which came first? That answer we have. So the seed is in the apple and the apple is in the seed. Here is our list of 12. And we've been working with these for weeks now, but probably not seen the whole, make it nice and easy for us. 42, there we go. Okay, we begin with ignorance. And, uh, there we go. Let me, hmm, I want to, yeah, 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 let's see here. So I'll, I, I should have put these two lists together here. Ignorance in Chinese is wu ming, no light, lack of light. What happens when there's no light? It's dark. Ignorance covers us. So that's the state of all of us before we wake up. The Buddha, Yo Ming, right? The Buddha has light. Where did he get his light? He uncovered the light that was already part of his nature. We are covered by ignorance because it's like uh, a shade over the lamp. It's like when you have a projector and you lean a piece of cardboard against the projector, suddenly it's dark, right? Somebody did that the other day in a lecture hall and it was so dramatic because the projector was trying its best. The projector was shining out with 22,000 lumens and they put a little piece of cardboard thook, and the whole projector was thook, dark, you know, it's just gone. So that cardboard is covering our nature right now. So we don't understand. Okay, each of these words now will have this word in front of the verb. This is the verb. This word occurs 12 times. Conditions, but it's, what word is it? It's this word. Yuan. Here it is. And Yuan, we say climbing on conditions. A condition, oh, the Buddhists of old divided this into 24 kinds of Yuan moves. That kind of thing. It's in the middle of nothing going on, something bumps. Okay, something in your stomach bumps. You're driving, now if it's a guy, let's say, at least I'll, when I was growing up, you're driving down the road, everything's fine, you're pleased with your car, you have wheels, it's shiny, you washed it, and you're kind of got your arm on the windowsill and you're driving with one hand. You know the state. And you look out the window and somebody passes you in a BMW S model and taps the accelerator bang, bang, as it goes by and suddenly your afternoon's ruined, you know? It's like, man, I wonder what that's like to drive, you know? That's activities, right? 30 seconds ago, just fine. You're king of the road, right? Now it's like, Man, this car, like I'm behind in my payments and there's a crack on the windshield and, you know. Suddenly, oh, it's, it's, it's spoiled because we would say greed arises. But the Buddha would say, right. Now, where did the xing come from? The answer almost always is, I don't know. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm out of my league at this point. And you could say I'm in, in deep water, but I'll do the same for women. I, I'm going to go to shoes or rings. Okay, ring on the finger, right? I don't notice shoes. We've established that. That's one of my frequent, you know. I don't see shoes. I just, I'm blind to shoes. I don't know what's, who's what. But I know there are people who notice shoes. And it's like, you just see they're on your radar. It's like, yeah. And read things into the shoes. Or... You know, if somebody shows up with a big sparkling thing on that finger, it's like, oh, all gear, shing, something moves. It's like, right? Where was it before? Before it wasn't. But now you notice that's shing. So it's volitional activities. And volition means you allow it to be. At some point it kicks into, you give permission for that thought. Minutes ago, 
copacetic, fine and cool. Now you, your eye sees something, your ear hears something, and you move. That's shin. Okay, and it comes from ignorance and it pulls in the next thing, which is consciousness. And this is shi, which is what? You are aware. Consciousness funbi cuts up, slices up, chops up, dices, and categorizes. It notices, right? Consciousness. Your mind saw the BM. Your eyes saw the BMW. You de- you registered desirable better than mine before you knew it, right? You see the shoes and you think, "Ooh, I'd like those in my closet." Jimmy Choo's, Manolo Blahnik. I want them, you know. And so consciousness is in there going, click. As a result of the movement from the sight that you saw, the sound you heard, the smell, the taste, the sensation of touch, whatever it was, consciousness now exists. You're aware. You're aware. And we're going along steps, 12 steps in a chain. From ignorance, no problem. You're just in the middle, balanced, cool. But because of that covering, we are not consciously aware until something moves. Oh, now we're aware. So third link already, down the chain. Okay? And consciousness depends upon that activity and it brings about something else. It pulls into being name and form, names and forms, make it plural here, names and forms, which is our mental, intellectual setup is that we like to know. We want to know, and so we give it a name. We recognize it. It's now, not only are we conscious of of it, we can't stop there. We have to, you know, what do we say? Inquiring minds want to know, right? You just want to know. So we give it a name. We categorize it. Friend, foe. Attainable, unattainable. Happy, sad. You know, not, this is not emotion yet, that comes later, but it's the mind starts to categorize it. Is it animal, mineral, or vegetable, right? Is it human? These are the things that we, we know. I'll tell you, here, right at this point, name and form is something very primal. Um, I register snakes uh, in my gut. That's what I learned. I learned it when I was living in Taiwan. There, where we are in, in Taiwan, I lived in, uh, down in Liu Gui in Kaohsiung Xian. Uh, our monastery is uh, in a forested area of a hill near six turtles, Liu Gui, and there's abundant snakes, many different kinds of poisonous, toxic, lethal, nasty snakes. And lethal to humans, they're fine by themselves, right? So what I learned was, all I have to do is come into the kind of the presence of a snake, not really close to it, but present to it, and my body knows whether it's harmful to me or not before my eyes really register. Before I get to name and form, something in me has gone, be careful, jump. I've seen monkeys do that on YouTube, right? Monkeys come into the presence of a snake that's harmful and they jump back and the snake snaps right at their belly and missed because the monkey jumped, you know, I found, I'm snapping my fingers a lot, that's interesting. Um, I found myself jumping away from the snake before my mind consciously went, ah, there's a snake. And I think it's hardwired. I think it's protection from the monkey that we are, you know. So I would attribute it to right here. I think that's the link. It's pre-conscious, really. Because its name and form has not quite said poisonous snake. I'm already in motion away from it which is very helpful. <laughs> Self-preservation. Funny, funny. In Australia, the same thing. Came around the corner at lunch, heading for school, and right there on my deck was a six-foot carpet python. 
minding his own business, sunning himself on our nice hot day. And I was in the air propelling myself backward before. And then as soon as my mind thought snake, I went right to his nose where you can see whether it's poisonous or not. And it wasn't. Needing to know whether we see it, smell it, taste it, hear it, feel it, think it. They come into being. Okay, so this is happening at warp speed. Just, just in a constant link. How do we know this is true? The Buddha sitting in stillness in samadhi watched this process unfold. Do I have the wrong character? I Name and form? Thanks, Nam. Your Chinese is getting much better, Nam. I noticed that. <laughs> Correct. Hallelujah. Liu Ru. Entrances, six senses. They are pulled into being by the name and form, so you need them. They, in turn, because the six senses are open, because they're functioning, they want to encounter. So we want contact with what? Eye wants contact with sight. Consciousness is there telling the difference. Ear wants contact with sound, telling the difference. High sound, low sound, mother's voice, my enemy's threat, shout. We want to know, right? So contact happens with the what are called the 18 realms. Six senses, six objects of sense, six consciousnesses. Once there's contact, we distinguish feeling. Here's the Chinese for feeling. Show. Show happens, is pulled into being by contact. And then feeling itself, which is, it feels pleasant, it feels unpleasant, it feels cold, it feels hot, it feels nice, it feels coarse, it feels uh, too hot, back away, pull your hand off the stove, it feels just right, I love it, right? That, in turn, brings about a reaction. And here is where, these are the places where karma becomes irreversible which is when feeling turns to love. At this point, it's still neutral. And if we have, right here, if we have stillness and samadhi, you can bless all of these. The Buddha is not saying bad and wrong. He's saying, here's how it works. Here's where suffering comes from where misery and suffering, and here's where it cannot be reversed. If we can catch this experience at this point, at feeling, and say, yep, that's how it feels okay, and you know what? I'm not moving. Because why? Every dharma, every single phenomena is based on conditions. And it goes away based on conditions. There's nothing there to get. If I move at this point and decide I love this, then I've been moved by conditions. And when I finally think I've got it, the thing that I love, guess what? Nothing there, just like everything else. So here is where samadhi turns what could become an inevitable rush towards suffering or just another experience, neutral and fine, to be appreciated mindfully to be used effectively to help others. Here is where k karma can be skillfully t turned or not. Okay? Once we love it, the, the Sanskrit word is trishna, thirst. Once we need it because we're thirsty for it, then we're pulling about, we're conditioning, we're bringing in tongue is the woman giving birth. 
So existence is that state of it's there, but it hasn't arrived yet. It's coming, hasn't arrived. But it's coming. It's like you can't be a little bit pregnant, right? Once you're pregnant, there's a child coming. So at that point, there's no more choice. It's in, wait the required number of months and, and the birth will happen. Um, so another way to describe this is what I was saying is back here, there's still choice. Feeling does not necessarily imply that you have to grab it. You can feel it and say, yeah, I felt that. That's real. I know it. It's not real, but it's real. I felt it and I'm fine. I don't need it. Shout and go, mm, grab it. But once you do, it's coming. Okay, so here there's freedom. Here there's no more freedom. Stephen. Can you, there's a, uh, Alan, can you help him with that? Closer? Oh, yeah. there you go. All right. Um, what I was saying is, does it have to be love? Could it be loathe? When you have a feeling, it can be a negative feeling too, yes? Loathe. Yeah, so you, you, you love you, or you say something's a good thing or it's yes. a bad, bad feeling. Yes. Uh, and so I was just curious since we used the word. Stephen, yeah. Stephen has further refined and the, um, thank you, you're absolutely right. And often when this is explained, it's to be complete, you have to, uh, and the Buddha actually taught this way. He said, there is attraction or antipathy. There is revulsion. And either way, whether, and it, that love is a difficult translation here because why? Describing this, it sounds bad. It sounds like we're slamming the 12 links. And love is the highest good for most of the theistic religions on the planet, right? You go to a, a Christian or a Catholic and say, you know, love is bad and they will not want to hear any more. There's a problem with you. You don't understand because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to come and save us. So, you know, so this is an unfortunate love here does not mean uh, agape. It's not broad, expansive love that Jesus felt for the lepers and for prostitutes and for everyone. It's not. This is love uh, eros, right? Selfish, personal, attached, romantic love. Stephen just refined it to say it is also that equally strong, powerful link called hatred or loathing or aversion. So it's both attraction and aversion are both here. Thank you. Correct. And it is active, dynamic, really strong, because why? It pulls along this holding on to. We don't, if we love something, we're not at the point where we say, I love you so much, I'm going to let you go. You know, that take, you have to get to reel three of the movie before the hero can say that, right? Like, you know, Titanic, right? To let them go. Oh. Even then there was no choice, but... So, you know, I love you so much I can let you go. That's really an elevated level. That's the, the plot has to move forward. You have to go get some more popcorn before that happens, right? Mostly it's grasping. Mostly you love it or you hate it so much that you want to kill it. Okay, grasping. And this is dynamic and strong and active and really uh, sticky because it brings into being becoming. Existence, coming into being. Three names... One principle, yo, it exists, it's now coming. And this is a dynamic, active, powerful link which pulls into being birth, it's here. It exists in form and this conditions and pulls about, pulls into being, brings about inevitability. You know that on your birthday, your life is shorter every single day. The day you're born is the first day leading to your death. And people say, 
you Buddhists, just all suffering all the time. Get over yourselves, right? Nah, it's true. So uh, it's also with mindfulness, with it's also an opportunity to serve and to celebrate. But to what we need to do to make to tr- flip that over to transform these agents of transformation is we can't be covered with ignorance because most of the time all of these links pull us down into this which is not which is not one of the 12 links but it's the place that the buddha usually started when he described these because the question came up why does it hurt why does it hurt so bad right people break up by text right you get dumped by text message don't want to see you anymore we're through you know why does that hurt so much it's because we didn't exercise patience here it felt good so we did it again right that was ernest hemingway's the the time when it was in paris in the 30s you know if it feels good do it again so that was kind of the the feeling of the era no sense of moderation no sense of stopping when you have enough not and if that's true that's why it hurts because why you have brought into being love which hangs on comes into being birth is happens and birth inevitably matures ripens goes bad now if when old age sickness and death happens and we're fine with it no suffering but that's pretty rare most people can't be patient when the thing we love breaks up and goes away changes to the degree that we're attached that's how much it hurts so okay that's the buddha's first run through and when uh, when master hua would introduce this to us he would say lao bing si the third that the 12th branch old age sickness and death yo bei ku nao yi che ku shu worry grief suffering misery the entire tree of suffering they would say comes into being after things get old get sick and die so it's not the last branch but the tree of suffering has all those and our uh last last week we had that description in the sutra sam so if the relationship goes bad and the person that we love goes away is that bad but we say hey you know that's the way things happen and that can reduce our suffering is that what you're saying yeah, yeah, yeah in theory correct it depends on who she is i think you know or he or but yeah if you can like now if it's like you're totally unfeeling monster then that's its own suffering you know but yeah if you can but then you know if this were a traditional buddhist story guanyin bodhisattva would show up to test you and see if it's really okay you know you'd get a test right away to see if you know what what are you attached to you know so if you can be like people said to sure food remember this um i i told this story just two months ago this uh dharma gunslinger showed up in taiwan and he was really ready to shoot down master hua he wanted to test his his zen his zen uh banter out and so he kind of came up you know macho walk you know what's what's the highest state and master hua turned his back and said meo zhi zhao you know like that no attachments and walked away and this guy was like come on come on what draw draw oh, you know no attachments and and that's that's the real answer what's the highest state no attachments because why you've broken ignorance 
But if you haven't broken ignorance and you pretend to, there's a test coming, <laughs> you know. And you can be accused of being a heartless monster too. So, so. All right. So, what do we got? Here's the list. Wu Ming, Yuan Xing. Okay, we're going to run it the other direction, which is Mie. Okay. When, uh, let's do it on this one, this list here. Boost them up. I use and heartily endorse Nisus Writer. My computer is almost entirely Microsoft free, by the way. Um, Word is here, but only to get out of a jam. I use Nisus Writer. Nisus means strength. Nisus Writer Pro on your Mac. Recommended. Okay, so this program is brought to you by Nisus Writer. So, um, developed by a mathematics PhD at University of UC San Diego uh, years and years ago. It's what it does, allows me to do Chinese beautifully. Okay, so the Buddha said, now, that's how the suffering comes into being, but lo and behold, I have discovered how suffering ends, which is you run the 12 links once again from start to finish, and instead of yuan, Instead of it blinking, it mia, it, it wipes out, it puts an end to. When ignorance is put an end to, then volitional activities are put an end to, stop. When volitional activities stop, consciousness stops, right? So you just go through the whole list again uh, with the, the word being stops or comes to an end. The, the, um, it's literally to eradicate, to extinguish. That's, the mia means to extinguish. So the Buddha runs them through again each time. And, you know, he takes it down the whole list. And the important thing is when you get down here, that comes to an end. Suffering ends when each link no longer pulls the, the, the next one along. So, um, I'll take you back to the top where we were. So, usually when you, if you say, what are the 12 links? You say, ignorance pulls along, links itself to volitional activities, xing, and then that one leads to, ig to consciousness, etc. But you come back to the top and say, and the Buddha said suffering can end because all you do is put an end to ignorance. Okay, what does it mean to put an end to ignorance? Well, samadhi is that meditative state of stillness where everything is going on around you all of your senses are firing as always, but you see them arising in the mind, in yi xin, in a single thought, like we heard in the text, and you go, wow, look at that. That's just amazing. It's all arising together, and I don't have to move. Because you see it rising, and you see it falling. You see it rising, and you see it falling. And that's why the, this, is a, this is the state of Prajnaparamita, number six, arises out of what? Number five, which was all about what? Meditation. If we have stillness, because we, why? We sat still a long time. We meditated a lot until we got good at it. And your mind is really calm, and your body is balanced in the center, not hungry, not craving, not upset, anxious, but still and balanced and in harmony the way how the Buddha got there he ate the meal offered him by the milkmaid he was starving and just about to die 
He couldn't see this because he couldn't, he was so weak, he just toppled over almost. And he had left the middle way. He couldn't focus. He came back, ate a little bit, stayed in the middle. His meditation went ding. This was clear. So you're sitting and what? Ignorance breaks up when you understand how the thoughts are rising. And you see that they are all based on other stuff. No single phenomena in your experience has an intrinsic core that exists free of other stuff. Not one. They all exist because of other conditions. Which means what? They will come apart based on other conditions. They are not ultimate. Don't be confused by them into thinking, that's the one I'm waiting for. When I get that, I'm home. Samadhi lets you see that and you sit calm and peaceful in the midst of everything, 10,000 things around you going through these pulls and pulls and you're not pulled by them. You're free of the tug of the conditions. That's what it means. Ignorance is over. Therefore, activities, xing, right? You don't have to. You don't have to go for it, right? Consciousness is over. You don't have to go for it. You can, but you don't have to. It doesn't tug you because you see it. You are ming. You're clear and awake. So that's why this number six, our sixth ground, follows number five, which is about meditation. This is the result of that stillness. Here's what I like about the Buddha Dharma. He said, you can see this on your own. It's not up to me. Don't, don't take it from me. Sit still. You can do it. When ignorance ends, you're free. Mostly, now he didn't say when ignorance ends, everything's empty. It's that you are alive, still, complete, whole, in the midst of all these conditions. Your eyes still work. When it's cold, you still put on clothes. When you're hungry, you still eat food. But your clarity about how the whole process works is just like a mirror. Your wisdom works like a mirror. You see it perfectly. You're free to choose. That's the bodhisattva state. Okay? So I think that's very neat. And it's very democratic. Men can do it. Women can do it. Everybody can do it. Emptiness is meaningless on its own. That's not what the Buddha was teaching. He was saying everything brings about everything else because it's interdependent. If with feeling and contact, these links right here, contact and feeling right there, if our, our eyes see the form, we our tongue feels the, the ice cream, the coolness and the sweet, if with feelings and contact we use the si, wuliang xin, four limitless attitudes of kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, then each contact, each feeling that we experience mindfully, knowing that it's not me, it's not mine, I don't have to own it, can be a chance to expand our awareness and to include others, to widen the scope of compassion. So ignorance over doesn't mean we're gone, we're out of it and free and it means that we have choice and we're aware of the opportunity to serve. The six senses become tools of transformation, not more knots for bondage. We sit still through the becoming and we rest complete and full, content, willing to help. The Buddha said, when ignorance ends, there is clear understanding. He did not say, when ignorance ends, there is nothing. Okay, that's key. And this is the Avatamsaka's explanation of the 12 link. So, this is not nihilism. The Buddha is not saying, smash the 12 links. That's just another kind of bondage. That's too much activity, right? You can't smash them. This is as real as gravity. This, these 12 links are as scientifically established, you might say. Okay, but we're still waiting 
for the electron microscope to uh, to reveal them in peer-reviewed journals so that we can science can say oh it's real okay now I'm not going to do this tonight but I wanted to show you there is systems people have over the years gone through systems of breaking these down they're saying there's two kinds of cause and effect ignorance and activities are the causes of consciousness names and forms six senses and contact we've gone from halfway along feeling thirst grasping and becoming these four seven to ten are the causes of birth old age sickness death and suffering so that's one way to look at the 12, right? If you want to, our inquiring minds want to know, right? We kind of slice it up in other ways. This is going to come out in, uh, in the 12, in our sixth ground. So the first two cause three to six. Ignorance and activities planted down, their seeds, these come into being. Consciousness, names, form, sense, contact. That's where we use samadhi and fe <coughs> feeling love, thirst, and grasping if we don't plant them down, liberate us from birth, old age, sickness, and death. But boy, it takes real keen samadhi. Okay, there's another way to say past is ignorance and volitional activities. The stuff I did in the past brings into being these. These are present, three to ten, and those seeds bring about future birth, old age, sickness, and death. Okay? So that's just two ways of looking at these. Three times and two kinds of cause and effect. There. How are we doing? Is this a lot? Can you, so far so good? Is this like useful? Why are we talking about this? It's what the Buddha wants us to know about the sixth ground. Why? Because we're at number six. We've come out of samadhi in which is the fifth stage. Now we're into Buddha saying, here's what I saw. I turned my wisdom, my electron microscope of my wisdom onto this thing called people and all beings. Here's what's going on. Here's why it hurts. So this is basically his answer to the question he raised when he left the palace and went looking. Here's what he saw. This is why it hurts. And as long as we are ignorant of the nature of things we meet, we're going to be tugged along by this chain. It's really hard to escape. But if we can sit still and say, yeah, that's a really nice BMW, but man, I don't want his payments. You know, my car has to, you know, kind of stay in the right lane a lot, but sure gets me there, and I kind of like it. It's got character, you know. And that BMW goes, it's fine. You know. Wait till you have the platinum card and you can afford it. You know. And if you see the shoes and you say, you know, those shoes look really good on her. They suit her really well. She looks great in them. I'm going to tell her when I get the chance. It's like, oh, that's nice. You know, you don't, they don't stir the, the love and grasping or the aversion. So you're free of it. So this is in our next thought. Tonight, at some point before we go to sleep, this, these 12 links are going to play havoc in something we're going to meet. And you're going to go, no, nah, it's okay. I actually, I only have two hands. How much can I hold? I have to drop one thing to pick the next one up. And it's not different than the other one. It's the same. Right? Like uh, Marty uh, talked about his, uh, Marty was, grew up on a farm, dairy farm in Wisconsin, Marty Verhoeven. And uh, he said, um, let's see, do we want to look at that? Yeah, I think we will. There's the bird. Um, he, he said, uh, one of the stories his grandfather talked about was, uh, he described stupid, his definition of stupid was uh, black bear when the corn was ripe and what was the what he saw this is in wisconsin and their bear and uh near appleton there's rural farm 
And when the corn is ripe, the bears come into the, the corn rows and they snuffle. Their eyesight's pretty weak. They sniff and here comes a ripe ear of corn. So they reach out their paw and they grab it, and rip it off and tuck it under their armpit. They do. And then what do they do? They reach out to grab the next ear of corn and tuck it under the armpit, dropping the first one. And they do this all the way down the row. And when they get to the end, they have one ear of corn. <laughs> you know, stupid. And they, they loved watching the bear, thinking that he was stuffing himself full of corn, and he only wound up with one. You know, the one to pick up the other, and in the end, he still snores, you know. Okay, um, this is interesting. Let's see if, oop, that's not the one I want. Here we are. Um, ideas that I think are helpful. Yep, there we go. S emptiness is a difficult concept. A lot of people find it confusing. One of the first ways we miss it is when we think emptiness is nothing, nihilistic. It doesn't mean nothing. Empty, the way the Buddha described it. Emptiness does not deny that things exist. It says that things exist in a temporary, non-substantive way. They don't last. The self that is an individual, has a personality, thoughts and feelings, is not negated by emptiness. But what is negated is the idea that the self exists as an independent entity in an ultimate sense, that I'm going to be here forever just as me, that I'm, me and mine are really here and important. That it is unconditioned and doesn't depend on anything else to come into existence. That's what the Buddha says is not understanding truth in the primary sense. Some people understand the non-substantiality as I don't really exist permanently, but they don't fully grasp the crucial element which is how things are relative and dependent on each other. Nagarjuna says, all things that arise through conditioned arising, I say are empty. This is the conventional way to describe it because it is also the middle way. Pratita Samapada is a term translated as, you'll see it as dependent origination, dependent arising, dependent co-production, dependent co-arising, and so forth. We can call it interdependent, openness, interconnected. Those are all ways, the same name for the Shri Aryanyan, Pratitya Samapada. Why are things empty? Because everything is interconnected. Nothing comes into being on its own. Therefore, nothing exists on its own. Things exist at once because of other things. They are empty of svabhava, of zixing, of their own nature. And this is why the Heart Sutra says, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form doesn't differ from emptiness, emptiness doesn't differ from form. Okay, the last statement here I think is worth understanding. Understanding emptiness is the sixth step, Prajnaparamita, transcendent wisdom. The central message of the Heart Sutra is that because of emptiness, the Bodhisattva path is possible. If emptiness meant only that the self is gone, that wouldn't provide any reason to practice compassion because once you're, you're gone, who cares? It's over, right? But it's not true. Because beings are also interconnected, your mother, your child, compassion is not only possible, but first, foremost, paramount. Interconnectedness means we're all equal. We're essentially one in our insubstantiality. Therefore, we have to save everyone to save even one. The bodhisattva path is practice for self and others. Just like form and emptiness, we don't differ one from the other. So, there you go. How about that? Okay. Um, now, it's... I wanted to... Let's see. While I'm here, 
before we shut this all down, um, usually we would do the transference and then come back, but since we're at the computer, I wanted to share something interesting. Today we had a, um, a, a new class, which uh, we're all proud of. And it was a class on Chinese calligraphy. Um, the monastery has offered, uh, oh, who dat? It's early in the morning. He's all puffed up. That's how he sleeps at night with his puffed up for warmth, right? He arrived before he saw me. And as soon as he sees me, he brings it all down. And he looks, you know, hello. Good eye. See his feet? His feet can't compete. His claws are for perching, not for ripping. He's, that's a difference in birds. Those are perching claws. They can grab on a branch. The kuruwang is for ripping. So... The, uh, but he's got the beak, so that's, you know. Hello. Good eye. All right. So anyway, um, just to say, we have these classes. And uh, uh, Jin Fo Shi is, uh, has been, uh, where are we here? Has been teaching um, calligraphy at various places, including the boys' school, summer camp, and all. And it's a really popular class because calligraphy is um, every person's art. It's a uh, every man's art, every woman's art. So calligraphy class. And it gives people uh, an immediate connection with something very ancient. And Chinese civilization, um, Chinese culture, has this amazing ability to judge character from handwriting. I've studied Chinese calligraphy on and off for years and never really applied myself, so I never progress. I'm still at like first grade level with a brush. But I marvel at people's ability, the fascination with Chinese handwriting with a brush that people have. Uh, once when I was down at, I, at uh, the Translation Institute in Burlingame, uh, one of our uh, laymen from Taiwan was passing through, and he said, Asher, he said, can you use a Mobi? Do you write? I said, no, you don't want to see my characters. It, it, once you read my characters, it's all over. You'll, you'll know exactly what a phony I am. And he said, oh man, too bad. He says, if you as a monk could do calligraphy, he said, the world is yours. He said, you'll be such a hit in China. He said, you could also get rich. You could sell every piece for 10,000 bucks. To have a monk, a senior monk who can do good calligraphy, your future is golden, he said. Oh, too bad. How about a photograph? Yo, I can sing. <laughs> Not the same, monk. No. So here was our class today. Full house. Look at the setup. Isn't that neat? And this is the first class. Jin for sure, I'm doing some free advertising for your class here. So... There were lots of smiling faces. And the results, the results are on the board in the back if you want to see how it came out. Pretty dynamic. Lots of concentration. Now, um, one of the best things about calligraphy is that um, people who understand it say that it is 
worthy of respect as a martial art that rivals Tai Chi or Qigong for elders. Uh, I never quite understood this, but uh, our, our master Jiang, Jiang Yunzhong, from Wenwu School, Locke's uh, Shifu, martial arts Shifu, and Marty's Locke's martial arts Shifu, and Hung Liang Shi's martial arts Shifu, he says that if you can really do skillful calligraphy, it is a workout a body and mind that equals, you get the same result as being able to do Qigong and Tai Chi. And as a result, you can do it longer in old age. So there are lots and lots and lots of 90-year-old calligraphers who are very fit, very sharp. It exercises body and mind and spirit in a way that uh, no martial art can do. Look at these smiles here. Look at Guohua, she's got a good character back here. <laughs> Suzanne is concentrating here. Either <laughs> Shonet, huh? Here we are. Oh, Kojan is focused. Oh, we get to analyze her characters here. Shi Cheng Zhang Dynamic. Look at the repeated patterns here. Guodran wields a fast brush. Look. Uh, uh, we get to look at your characters here. Quick, analyze her character. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yan Lin is, I don't know if he's, is that embarrassment or is that, uh, I think he's happy. He's kind of, clearly he is. All right. So this is uh, something to pay attention to, and uh, I'm delighted that you know Sherfo is looking over our shoulders here, and delighted that the uh, monastery can support uh, people's experience with uh, arts that can uh, change your life and give you something a satisfying skill that you will uh, be able to use till you can't pick up a brush any longer. Further, um, there is no doubt that this is uh, an aspect of Chinese culture that is honored by time. There have been calligraphers as long as there have been Chinese characters. Da Jian, Xiao Jian, Li Shu, right? Xing Shu, Kai Shu, Cao Shu. The, uh, if you practice Li Shu, look at how nice your teacher is. How can you not come and study with him? If, if you practice Li Shu, these, that's a form that was created by Li Si, the prime minister of Qin Shi Huang Di, the emperor who built the Great Wall. So when you pick up your brush and rub your ink on the inkstone, you are stepping into a line of Chinese culture that goes back to the dawn of one of the greatest civilizations on the planet. So don't look lightly on this. This is a big deal. That's what the bird says. Okay, we are going to raise the screen, turn off the projector, do our transference.
Okay. You'll find the transference of merit on the last page of your songbook that you have in front of you. And please use your mind and your heart to send out that goodness however you would like it to go, wherever you would like it to, to travel. The Dedication of Merit is a um, collaborative. It takes everybody's, to be effective, it takes everyone's best concentration and your biggest heart. It, the merit that you send out goes as far as your mind can reach. So don't be stingy. thinking about a song that might relate to our talk tonight and uh, what I came up with was Samadhi Shoes because it's talking about meditation and Samadhi Shoes, of course there are no such thing, page 52, but it's, it's a metaphorical sense of getting your meditation to where you can sit still through the arising of the potential for love and grasping. And that doesn't make you heartless and a monster or anti-Christian. It not. It's that you have more choice. And you can use that mindful contact and feeling to go beyond simple duality 
the potential is you don't have to get to that place of old age, sickness and death. It's not inevitable. The Buddha got enlightened underneath the tree. His mind was like a round full moon because he entered Samadhi. He put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes. Walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes. I'm going to raise the pitch a whole step so I can actually sing the song without sounding like a frog. Tame your mind and body. Say goodbye to the blues. Walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes. Samadhi concentration comes from precepts pure. Tame your body, mouth, and mind. Walk through Samadhi's door. Put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes. Walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes. Calm your mind and body. Say goodbye to the blues, walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. I hold my precepts purely when sitting in the hall, but when I walk out that Chan Hall door, I couldn't hold those rules at all when I put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes, walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes, calm mind and body, say goodbye to the blues. Walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Okay, here's the 12 links unawakened to, right? My eyes attached to beauty. Which link is that? Contact, right? Right? Or is that Xing? It could be Xing. It could be activities. It could be contact. My eyes attached to beauty. My ears love pretty sounds. That's love, obviously. But when it's time to meditate, my mind turns upside down till I put on some body. Put on Samadhi shoes, walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes, mind and body. Say goodbye to the blues, walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes. Aha, now here's the Mie part. Here's the done away with. Samadhi tames my senses. I turn the light around. My thoughts are like a gentle stream, and I hear compassion sound. Put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes. Walking all the way to Buddhahood. Put on Samadhi shoes. Take mind and body. Say goodbye to the blues. Walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Here's the teenager's verse. My parents used to bug me. I could do nothing right until they learned to meditate. Now they never get up tight because they put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes. Walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Join me, tame my mind and body, say goodbye to the blues. Walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Here's the business person's voice, the workplace verse. I meditate each morning, then I join the marketplace. 
Because I wear Samadhi shoes, there's a smile upon my face. I put on Samadhi shoes, put on Samadhi shoes, walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Change my mind and body, say goodbye to the blues, walking all the way to Buddhahood, put on Samadhi shoes. Put on Samadhi shoes, put on Samadhi shoes. Well, it's a goal one might aspire to. Rather have Samadhi shoes than Manolo Blahniks anyway. Because nobody wants them. They're just kind of plain and ordinary. Okay. We have a Buddha recitation Sunday tomorrow. Anybody who would like to come to join our group to recite the Buddha's name from 7.30 to 5, including lunch, do it in silence, and uh, have a group experience of Pure Land practice, you are welcome and invited. Please do come and try it out. Um, 7.30 in the morning. Till five. You don't have to stay till five. Uh, there's a real feeling of accomplishment if you do. Um, so that's happening. Then um, next Thursday is. Can you pass that microphone to the monk in the front? So we've been having an ongoing series introducing Buddhist concepts and meditation. And we're actually, I think the next topic is actually going to be on samadhi. Mm. So we went through the Four Noble Truths. Uh, we talked about um, kind of some basics of meditation. Uh, we talked about the precepts. And so now we're going to be moving on to samadhi. So this upcoming Thursday, we're having that class. Um, it's every other week. Um, and everybody's very welcome to join. If you have young people who you know would like to learn about Buddhism, that's a good class to join. Join. Um, the other class, actually, we also have Monday evenings, and Doug Powers is leading it. It's called Buddhism for the Modern Mind, and so um, that's happening this week as well. I don't know, what's the topic? Do you know what the topic is for this week? Okay. I know the previous top topics were something like, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? <laughs> Do I trust my own mind? Those questions like that. So, um, so I think that's it, Monday and Thursday. Okay. Great. Um, Calligraphy class is going to be every week. Is that right? Okay. Okay, but next Saturday. Okay, 3 o'clock. Next Saturday, more calligraphy. Um, let's see. Now, did, you, did we get someone to cover for tomorrow? That's all taken. Good. All right. So, um, people know that we... Uh, have a full program of meditation twice a day here at the monastery, free of charge. And we don't instruct, we don't teach during that time, but we open the doors, 6.15 in the morning, 7.15 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong. 6.15 in the morning, 5.15 uh, at night, twice a day. And uh, the, it's a very uh, still, quiet room where people are welcome to come sit. Uh, you don't have to do our style, you can bring your own style of meditation if you choose. And uh, it's, uh, we sit for an hour. And if you want to find out, if you want to check up halfway during the week what I said about that, go to berkeleymonastery.org. Berkeleymonastery.org. That's where you'll, you'll see the entire schedule. Um, what else do we have here to announce? Anybody? Okay, I think we're good. We're, we're in between sessions. The um, Guanyin session at CTDB has just finished and the big winter Chan and the Amitabhas are coming up. Uh, if you are a meditator and you want to try it, you might put on your calendar the, the uh, birth and death Chan session at CTDB coming up. That is a custom started by our teacher, Master Hua, at Gold Mountain, and or at Buddhist Lecture Hall, maybe. And uh, 
we have kept it going. It's a chance to really put your meditation to a road test. And uh, it's quite wonderful. If you've got a practice that you're confident in, that's the time to take it to the max and to really investigate uh, what's, what it's like to uh, sit together with a group of other dedicated meditators. CTTB is a magnificent place to practice stillness because uh, it's, it's been dedicated to cultivation since it, was, since it began. Nothing has died there in anger over 30 plus years. Uh, everyone is um, eating mindfully and working mindfully in order to make an environment where your practice can go uh, as far as you can carry it and there'll be support. So think, of, think ahead about whether you might want to uh, take time off from the other things you'll be doing at the end of the year to join the, the uh, Chan retreat at CTDB. Quite a life changer. Alan. The Chan retreat for the men's side, they normally have a one hour introduction and stretching exercise after breakfast. So for the men's side, if you are not really the long-term practitioner, so don't, don't be afraid so you can still come. So because there will be the introduction and also some uh, stretching exercise. Usually okay. uh, one uh, Bichu will teach us after breakfast. So do chan. we know what Alan's talking about? He said the winter Chan, right? So, yeah, so the win would you repeat that? So what Alan is saying is that during the winter Chan, there is an additional time in the morning on the men's side where we have some stretching and instruction on meditation. So it's not as uh, difficult as the schedule looks like. Although I would say probably if you're a first time meditator, it's not gonna be uh, that accessible. It's, it's one hour sits and walks throughout the day. But there's a, definitely a time in the morning when people can ask questions and get some stretching just to get ready for the day. So. Yeah, not, not to discourage you if you're a beginner, but it's a steep mountain because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the traditional way in China. It's the, the schedule that's being practiced at Guoqing uh, Si on Tiantai Mountain and at Yunjushan Cloud Dwelling, Zhenru Si, a true suchness monastery on Cloud Dwelling Mountain and it's it's uh, it's the the time to re like I say, test your test your skill if you've been working out. Sam. Correct. This is in Ukiah, Talmadge, city of ten thousand Buddhas, where the winter three week Chan goes on. So uh, consider consider if you want to start now, you've got about seven weeks to get your full lotus in gear. That's a funny image, isn't it? <laughs> I'm really still. Unlike the rest of us who say, I might be lost, but I'm really moving. <laughs> Pew! Where's he going? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So, if it's the Tao, the path, you want to advance upon it. If it's not the Tao, you want to retreat from it. Take what you heard tonight that's useful and put it into practice and take what's not helpful and change it in yourself. So, our guy. See you next week.